Hi, my name is Todd Seifert, and I'm the pastor at Centenary United Methodist Church. Thank you for joining us today for worship. We're worshiping exclusively online today because of a couple of factors. Truth be told, the weather was kind of borderline today, and if it was just the weather, we probably could have met together. But I know at least four people in our congregation who either have been exposed to COVID or who have a family member who has been. We also have people who just flat out told me that because of the snow, they probably wouldn't be in attendance today. So with that all in mind, we decided it was best just to keep people as safe as possible and provide the message via video this week. Please pray with me to start off today. I'll add some prayer requests to the Facebook comments with the video as we start out. Loving God, Jesus performed so many miracles during his time on earth. So many that often they're just referenced in terms like Jesus healed many in our scriptures. In so many instances, those miracles taught us about the compassion for the infirm, or they taught us lessons about the love and grace of you, our creator. Lord, today we examine Jesus' first recorded miracle, turning water into wine at a wedding. At first glance, it looks to be a frivolous kind of miracle. But we know there is much more to be learned if we'll only take the time to study and meditate on what it is that you have to share with us. But we aren't the most patient bunch, your followers, here in the 21st century. We're used to getting what we want when we want it. Help us to slow down, even just a bit. Allow us to pause for reflection on what the Gospels have to tell us about you, merciful God, about Jesus, and about the way you want us to interact, not just with you, but with our fellow human beings. Lord, we have so much to be thankful for, so we pause for just a few moments to say thank you privately for the many blessings that you've shared with us. Merciful God, we offer thanks this day for scientific breakthroughs that make our lives better, modern conveniences, information that helps us better understand the universe around us, and, of course, for medical advancements. And Lord, we offer up petitions this day for healing for those who need it, for discernment for those facing difficult decisions, for caring hearts and listening ears, for those in position to help those who need a shoulder to cry on or someone to talk to. And we ask that your presence be felt deeply by those this day who face despair, who are weighed down by stress, and who are struggling for myriad reasons to live their best lives. We humbly ask that you empower us and equip us to be the hands and feet of Christ, who taught his disciples and us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Mama's boy. It's a phrase that many people don't want to hear. What comes to mind when you hear those words? On the plus side, we think of someone who's polite, probably giving or nurturing. On the downside, though, there might be a person who's a little bit overly timid, who absolutely won't go against his mother or too often will bring her, decision, her into decisions, rather, even as an adult. TV has lots of examples of mama's boys. Reality TV is full of them, from the old days of Jerry Springer on up to Dr. Phil. But there's a classic example in a comedy show called The Big Bang Theory. Anybody who watches that show is probably a fan of Howard Wolowitz. He, takes a good, he talks a good game about his mom, but all too often, he just caves into her. From shying away from telling her that he's moving out after he gets married, something that most people would just assume, to bending to any whim she has for him, particularly about his future. But you see, you don't have to be a mama's boy to simply do what mama tells you to do, right? I mean, we're supposed to honor our mothers by doing what we're told. When we're younger and by at least giving some consideration to their advice when we're adults, after all, they've lived more life than we have. I think back to my childhood and recall some of the things my mom directed me to do. Some of the typical stuff. Clean my room, mow the lawn, do dishes, help her carry things upstairs or downstairs. When my friends and I would ride bikes in the neighborhood when we were kids, she would always direct me to be home at a very specific time. 
There was a stint when I was in fourth or fifth grade when my mom decided that we were going to be better educated as a family. And so every Saturday or Sunday afternoon, we would go to a museum somewhere in eastern Kansas or western Missouri. I'll admit that it did spark my interest in history and it fueled my imagination of how things used to be. But in those days, sometimes I just simply didn't want to go. But I always remembered not to complain because this was clearly important to her. Another thing important to her was our youth choir at church. She badly wanted me to be a part of it. She still remembered the days when I was a real little kid and had kind of a Frankie Valley voice. Uh, I sounded pretty good and I always got these solos in the school plays, especially around Christmas time. But when my voice changed when I was about 13, my singing voice went away with it. Now don't get me wrong, I enjoyed going to youth choir to spend time with my friends, but I was always embarrassed by my voice and my complete lack of dancing skills. My wife will tell you all about that if you ask her about it. But my mom always arranged for me to get a ride. If my Aunt Shirley couldn't take me or my dad couldn't take me, she would find someone to get me a ride there until I could drive myself, obviously. And then if I got a part, a speaking part in one of the plays, she would rehearse with me my lines over and over and over again. And she was always there sitting near the front when we performed. So I guess if that gets me labeled a mama's boy, I suppose I'll wear that with a badge of honor. Another example of her pushing me to do something I'm wearing today. This uh, quarter zip Jayhawk, the 1941 war mad Jayhawk, the one that I really like. My wife bought me this as a Christmas present this year. And it symbolizes something that was very important to my mom. You see, my sister was the first person in our family to attend college, but I was the first in our family to graduate with a degree from KU. Truth be told, I'm recording this after attending the KU West Virginia basketball game on Saturday, so feel free to pause right now and say the rock chalk chant to yourself if you feel like it. I'll wait. Okay, let's get back into the scripture today. Because you see, our scripture gives us a little insight into Jesus' relationship as an adult to his mother, Mary. It's famously known as Jesus' first miracle, turning water into wine. But I think it reveals so much more about Jesus' love for his mother than it does about supernatural power over drinkable liquids. Let's read it together, John chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples were, disciples were also invited to the celebration. When the wine ran out, Jesus' mother said to him, They don't have any wine. Jesus replied, Woman, what does that have to do with me? My time hasn't come yet. His mother told the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Nearby, there were six stone water jars used for the Jewish cleansing ritual, each able to hold about 20 to 30 or, gallon, 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water, and they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, Now draw some from them and take it to the head, water, head waiter. And they did. The head waiter tested, tasted the water that had become wine. He didn't know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. The head waiter called the groom and said, Everybody serves the good wine first. They bring out the second-rate wine only when the guests are drinking freely. You kept the good wine until now. This was the first miraculous sign that Jesus did in Cana of Galilee. He revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. May God add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and understanding of Scripture. We know the story pretty well, don't we? Jesus and his first disciples, likely Peter, James, John, Andrew, and maybe Matthew, were invited to go to a wedding with Jesus, or at least they tagged along. The wedding planners, unfortunately, make a huge mistake. They didn't bring enough wine. The family of the bride or groom must have been a friend of Mary's, Jesus' mom, because Mary is kind of in the know about what's going on, and so she goes to Jesus, and he turns water into wine. Now, in those days, tradition was that the good stuff was provided first, and then the cheap stuff was given out after everybody was either drunk or at least buzzed enough that they didn't care what kind of wine they were drinking or that it suddenly was watered down. Anyway, somehow there wasn't enough wine provided, and that's, signif that's significant because wine was the drink of choice. See, we live in, they live in a time when water could hurt you. There's no purification. And sometimes the water was murky. It was just kind of brown and dingy, full of bacteria. 
Well, we know that now. They didn't really know that then. They just knew that it could make you sick. There was no Coke Zero or Diet Dr. Pepper as an alternative. So wine it was. But Jesus being, well, Jesus, well, he makes the wine even better than any they have ever tasted. Go figure. The day is saved. But let's take a little deeper look into this exchange. Notice when Mary tells Jesus that they're out of wine, it's implied that he's going to do something about it. And Jesus doesn't immediately do so. He basically says, Ma, how is this my problem? He's saying that the wine is a pretty petty issue, and he's got way bigger things to work on. And he tells her that it's not quite his time yet. Not time to reveal that he has special power. Now, there's no real back and forth exchange recorded in Scripture, but based on what we see and what happens, it sounds like Mary probably flexed her mother muscles, likely turning to the servants and saying, This is my son. Do whatever he tells you. No questions asked. Jesus either has to do what his mom has just voluntold him to do, or he has to disappoint her. And that's important, because it would just be to disappoint her. Remember, nobody else at this party knows what he's capable of yet. Well, as you know, Jesus decides to follow his mom's instructions. He's a good boy. Maybe a mama's boy. Definitely a mama's miracle boy. And he doesn't just make a little wine. He makes 120 to 180 gallons of it. That's a lot of booze. <laughs> I'll confess that this miracle has always seemed strange to me. Why did Jesus agree to do this? If you look at all the other miracles that Jesus is recorded to do in the New Testament, well, they have to do with several things. Number one, healing. Restoring people to full health. Healing them from infirmity of some kind, whether it's disease or uh, being paralyzed. Tremendous acts of healing. And if it didn't have to do with healing, it had to do with teaching. This one, this miracle that we just talked about, it's just about showing power. It's a point that Jesus' ministry never really returns to after this one episode. So why did Jesus do it? Well, I think there's actually three fairly quick reasons we can get into that explains it. The first one, Mama said so. Jesus was a Jewish man in a culture that, as now, honors mothers. I'm not so sure he really wanted to do it, but he does it anyway. Second, maybe I need to admit right now that I was a bit too quick to judge this miracle as being frivolous. Note the way that our passage today ends. Quote, He revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. End quote. Yes, it was not about healing. It was not about teaching, or was it? It was more than just turning water into wine. It was something that nobody else could do. And these men who so far had signed on to work with Jesus in his ministry, but didn't quite yet know what he was capable of doing, all of a sudden they did. They had to be asking themselves, if he can turn water into wine, what else is he capable of? In other words, they got a glimpse of his greatness and probably had an easier time urging people to follow him because of this miraculous sign. Third and finally, this episode allows Jesus to share a metaphor about transformation, one that means a lot for us today. See, Mary believed Jesus could make water into wine. That wasn't a question at all. Maybe he'd even done that before. We don't know. Or maybe she just knew because of that miraculous birth that she was such a big part of. But if Jesus can change water into wine, then he's capable of changing the murky lives that we have before in nurturing a relationship with Jesus into a far purer life after we get to know him. You see, like that water, we can be transformed after Jesus intervenes. My guess is Jesus already has transformed a few things in your life. If not, I'm sure he's ready to do so. Mary basically told Jesus what to do. Well, we aren't his mama, and we don't have that kind of authority. But we sure can invite Jesus to transform us. We merely have to ask and be willing to be changed. And that's something that we all can toast to. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us.
for this brief online worship service at Centenary United Methodist Church. On a typical Sunday, we're there at 11 a.m. for worship at uh, uh, 245 North 4th Street in North Lawrence. It's right at the corner of 4th and Elm. We'd love to invite you to see us, come and spend time with us. Sunday school is actually at 930 if you want to join us then. Otherwise, we're always online. We usually post these in the afternoons on a Sunday, so check us out on Facebook or on our webpage, lawrencecentenary.org. Thanks so much. God bless you. Stay safe.